everyone. Welcome back to Visualizing Abolition, an event series created in partnership with San Jose Museum of Art and the Mary Porter Cezanne Art Gallery. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And together with Gina Dent, we visualize this series on art, visual culture, and the radical imaginary as part of the broader, urgent discussions around prison abolition currently underway in the United States and around the globe. Previous events in the series can be found archived at barringfreedom.org. Originally, um, additionally on barringfreedom.org are all the music videos created thus far for Music for Abolition, a music series curated by Terry Lynn Carrington. The music video for today by Nicole Mitchell Gant, award-winning creative flautist, composer, band leader, and educator will premiere at the end of the event and we'll introduce it more fully then. The website also has information about the related art exhibition Barring Freedom at San Jose Museum of Art, which has been temporarily closed due to the pandemic, but will be opening again soon. The exhibition explores the different strategies of representation contemporary artists use to expose publics to the deep social harms enacted by prisons and policing without reproducing the violences and explicit racism of these systems. Sanford Bigger's work is central in Barring Freedom bringing incredible nuance to the explorations of history and questions of how past and present forms of racism and struggles for liberation are perceived. Whether working with antique quilts to evoke the Underground Railroad, creating works in response to police brutality against Black Americans, or as creative director and keyboardist of Moon Medicine, a multimedia concept band that straddles visual art and music, Sanford's work offers a profound experience of the traumas and potentials of the current moment. He currently has a solo exhibition, Code Switch, at the Bronx Museum of Art, on view through April 5th, which has been wonderfully written about in the New York Times. He's also had solo museum exhibits at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and the Brooklyn Museum, among others. His work is in permanent collections at the Museum of Modern Art New York, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Walker in Minneapolis, and the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, to name just a few. It's quite a thrill to be able, it's been quite a thrill to be able to show his powerful works. And I hope many of them get to experience, many of you get to experience them at the San Jose Museum of Art when it reopens or at the Bronx Museum. It's also wonderful to have Lee Rayford here tonight in conversation. Her writings on visuality and visual culture have been part of the conceptual framework through which many of the questions posed by the exhibition and talks have been conceived. Lee is Associate Professor of African American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, where she teaches and researches about race, gender, justice, and visuality. She is the author of Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, Photography in the African American's Freedom Struggle, and her work has appeared in numerous academic journals and popular venues, including Art Forum, The Atlantic, and Al Jazeera. I'll have them come now to further conversation and thank them, and I'll bow out. I have to say for our audience, if you have any questions, please do put them into the Q&A and Gina and I will pop back in later to help moderate. Hi. Hi. See you later. Bye, Rachel. Bye, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, Stanford. Stanford, it's so nice to be here in conversation with you. Um, I'm really excited. I'm really nervous. Um, but I, I also just want to thank Rachel and Gina um, for inviting me and for this incredible project they've put together um, and also all of the people who've made this possible. And I'm thrilled um, and also grateful for to be part of a longer series of conversations. So we're, I think, probably maybe this, this is maybe the sixth or so um, in the Visualizing Abolition series. Um, and I think it's a, a kind of um, a really a beautiful pivot in many ways to think about um, the ways that um, we've sort of been looking at the history of visuality and the question of aesthetic in um, the project of abolition. Um, and I think your work is an invitation um, also to think about what we can do with those histories um, and what kinds of, of possibilities, um, uh, what becomes possible with uh, uh, a rigorous uh, attention to the past. 
So hi. <laughs> hey, hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. And uh, thanks for everyone for making this all happen. And I'm very happy to be part of this exhibition and this uh, series. Um, I wanted to start um, be with um, Infinite Tabernacle, well, with your work in Barring Freedom, um, because I actually haven't had the opportunity to see it in person. Um, and I haven't, I haven't seen BAM and I haven't seen Infinite Tabernacle. And so um, I thought we could just, we would just start uh, by showing the, the film um, and, uh, and then we can move into a conversation then.
was an, an incredibly powerful. Will you, um, will you just talk to us about the process of making? Yeah, you know, it's um, interesting. Um, after not having seen this in a little bit, it's um, sort of as jolting as it's always been um, from the first moment that we did this project. But um, what you're seeing is sort of um, a later addition to a series that I've been doing over the last few years called BAM. And in that series, I've been taking African sculptures from various regions, um, most of them that I've had in my personal collection for decades. And um, as a result of one morning waking up in Berlin, of all places, and looking at my phone and reading um, the news and seeing yet another, um, you know, more video footage of another Black man being killed. Um, I decided to use those pieces, use those sculptures to start to create this body of work. And the body really consists of taking the, the, the sculptures themselves and dipping them in wax. And I dip them in wax to sort of veil them because in many cultures, uh, the more powerful the object is, the less um, safe it is, the more sacred it is, and you can't really bear your, your bare eyes directly onto it. So it sort of conceals the power within. And I took them to those figures to shooting ranges and sculpted them with different caliber weapons, uh, nine millimeters, um, 22 caliber, uh, 12 gauge shotguns, um, you name it. And each one leaves a different imprint, a different mark on the figures. And once they were shot, I took the remnants and cast them in bronze. I do think it's important to note that I actually don't pull the trigger myself. Um, uh, one of my team pulls the triggers um, because I don't really want to get too precious and too artistic about how the impact of the bullets affect the bodies. I'd rather let that be more random and out of my control. Um, and so that's the basis of making the sculptures themselves. But this particular uh, piece, Infinite Tabernacle, is a compilation of several, documentation of several of those shooting events and choreographing them to um, basically dance between these various monitors. And you've noticed that sometimes the action is going forward as they're being shot, but sometimes it's in reverse as they are coming back together whole. And to me, this is sort of, um, I guess, a visual metaphor based on aspects of Buddhism, reincarnation, resurrection, regeneration, and so on. And basically to um, assert that the spirit and the memory of these victims persists. So in some case, these are miniature memorials. And this process is, you know, um, obviously a very violent act, but I like to think of it as also a productive and generative act. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's the uh, yeah. basis of it, yeah. I mean, it, I think it's interesting too that you, you refer to, um, to the, the, the process of sculpting, right? Through mm -hmm. uh, sculpting through, you know, by shooting at them as opposed to, you know, uh, a, a act like calling it destroying or calling it something else. And I think that, you know, there's something, um, you know, that the, that question of violence also becomes that the act of, of um, destruction is also like, pro creates new meaning in these pieces. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was interested in, I was reading a piece where somebody, you know, thought of this as a kind of critical, there's a kind of disregard that you have for the, the, the sanctity of, of um, these sculptures as art objects. Um, and it seems to me that that's so much actually the critique of the work that you're offering, right? Um, about the kind of, um, in a sense, returning the work to a kind of realm of, um, you know, everyday use, but also their power, right? And I think the um, in our conversation earlier, you you know, you just sort of reactivating them um, in a different kind of way, and I think reimbuing them with a power um, that has been forcibly extracted from them. Um, yeah. yeah, I definitely see it as a process of charging these objects, recharging these objects, because we're familiar with these forms being known as power objects in the first place, but 
the way most of us experience them, if we don't have them in our own home, and if we don't put them in a shrine in our own home, then they're usually seen as objects. And if we see them in a museum behind a vitrine or under a vitrine, they're definitely sort of uh, denuded and um, their power and their advocacy to some degree is taken away. They are objects, uh, you know, they're collected objects. And I think this process is bringing them back into contemporary dialogue. And I think the language is very important. And I think that distinction and that, that um, tension between muse the museological approach and the artistic approach is not only important, but it's well established. I mean, there's many artists that have used guns and ballistics in their work, all the way from Chris Burden to Nikki St. Fall. Um, and so I do see this very much in a long lineage of art that is made this way. And I think it's important that all those nodes are activated in this, pro in this project. Can you um, talk a little bit about what the, the kind of collective experience or process of this is? I mean, you sort of, you said you, you kind of see the, the, um, the actual, the work of shooting to your team, right? And I'm, you know, thinking about what that means as a kind of conversation, right? And as a, as a collective act um, as well, if that makes sense as a question. Uh -oh. well, I think we've lost Sanford for a minute. <laughs> um, I'm sure he'll be back shortly. Um, maybe while we're waiting, um, I'm going to ask Chloe if you can advance some of the slides so we can take a look um, about at the, at the sort of um, the installation as well. Um, and I'm just really, and I can share a little bit, just seeing that for the first time, um, you know, certainly being jolted initially um, by the gunshot, um, but also kind of um, placed in this kind of uh, cosmic sphere with the sort of sunlight and the, the um, you know, the dust floating, right? And these figures floating and, you know, and I'm, um, I'm just really moved by the kind of forward and backward motion of the ways in which it's a, we're really being asked to, um, you know, think about what kinds of um, transformation um, that black bodies, um, desecrated bodies, like the, the kind of um, what we become, right, after trauma. Um, and I think that's, um, for me, one of the a kind of really important question about um, both Sanford's work and um, sort of the larger project of visualizing abolition, right? That asks us to think about um, not only what freedom, you know, what what um, you know, uh, what an aesthetics of abolition looks like in the future, but I think. Um, I'm, I'm compelled by Infinite App Tabernacle um, to think about how um, how we have to uh, address histories of trauma um, and experiences of trauma as part of that journey towards um, an abolitionist aesthetics um, and the kind of ritual that's part of part of that work, um, the rich, the, the process of engaging in, um, in these acts of, of um, uh, returning to these histories. Well, yeah, Lee, I think that, you know, I've read a lot of your work, so I'm just going to jump in because and you're done a beautiful job, I have to say, with the, um, the leaving, but the, you know, the places where, because I thought so hard about this work, and the places where 
when we see history, trauma, the ongoing effects, the tensions of how to show it and not reproduce it, right? Mm -hmm. I think the Ruha Benjamin pointed out this wonderful, uh, I mean, it's awful, you know, but this thing that we keep talking about, which is we all know these systems exist. Oh. There's all of this evidence, there's all of these statistics and facts, but sometimes the fact that they are that, right, this explicit overt racism ends up reproducing the systems. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about your, the way that you feel about negotiating this tension. How do we show, this is a question of visuality, right? How do we show and not reproduce? Right, I mean, you know, it's something I was thinking about Ruha's statement um, last week, I was thinking um, Brian Stevenson said something very similar at the end um, of his convert their, that conversation, um, which was, you know, something and it was it was I, 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 the, the, the urgency of it, right? This kind of he's like, you know, I'm really um, uh, we don't need another generation of people um, pushing statistical data to prove a, a minute point, right? Um, you know, that, and he said that worries me. Um, and I think, you know, so much of what, um, you know, my work is primarily on photography and so much of what the visual has offered us, right, has, has, it's been deployed as a form of evidence, right? It's been deployed as um, a kind of confirmation of things that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, marginalized um uh, you know brutalized communities no already know to be true right and do not need the visual proof of um but the the you know visuality has offered that kind of confirmation right um even you know in, in my own work there Stafford, um my own work goes back to ida b wells um invoking welcome back <laughs> that technical difficulties over here. Uh, sorry, I had to switch laptops and change my view. Okay. Um, so I was just, okay, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Can I jump back in? Yeah, jump. I'm gonna go back out too. And thanks, Lee, I actually think that that was all really helpful and good. Okay. I'll fill you in, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anyway, as I was saying, um, basically, I, the process of making this uh, this work is almost very similar to working with new medicine, in the sense that I sort of set together the elements or the players and the instruments and the context. But beyond that, I sort of let those players do what they do. So when it comes to my uh, film team that I worked with for this piece, I've set it up. Um, I chose the sculptures and so on, help location scout and all that. But beyond that, I'm having them pull the triggers and we shoot lots of footage and then the rest of how we compose happens in post with all the footage, the A roll, B roll, and C roll that we have. Um, so that was part of your question. There was another part of that. Yeah, yeah. That I um, well, actually, I mean, let's, you know, um, can shift a little bit because we were sort of, um, when you stepped out for a minute, <laughs> um, Rachel and I were chatting about the, um, uh, what it means to tell these to to make art that addresses these histories of uh, or um, the reality of um, you know, of violence against black people um, that that is repetitive that seems ne that is never ending right um, and while but how to do so in a way that um, is transformative that doesn't um you know i think for me i'm always afraid you know or i i am skeptical of work that um offers up you know images of of um brutalized black bodies right um to 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 kind of do this history or share these these sentiments with us um and so you know so thinking about your practice um you know how do you um you know what what how do you um as rachel said toe that line or walk that space between um because th this infinite tabernacle is incredibly um it is both jolting as you said right from that initial shot shot um it is um you know 
violent. Um, and it is also, um, you know, for lack of a better word, redemptive in certain kinds of ways, right? There's a kind of that sense of transubstantiation that this the body can become something else and it can return um, and we can we can give it a new uh, or can I mean, give it a new life and new meaning. So how do you how do you um, walk that that line or find that space? Well, um, I agree with you. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's this is difficult work. Um, it's difficult for me making it. It's difficult for me watching it sometimes. But the context that I've allowed myself, the, the space I've allowed myself to inhabit while working on this type of project, um, it's sort of in the title, Infinite Tabernacle. For me, this is less about being an art piece that ends up in a museum or a gallery, but more about, um, as you mentioned, sort of um, recognize the infinite and sort of repetitive nature of the atrocities that are inflicted on you know, black Americans, but also looking at this as a tabernacle, a moment of communion where we can look and pay homage to the victims of this by looking at this, by dealing with this jolting, visceral, um, almost repulsive act, but looking between the lines and seeing that at the end of it, there's this sort of reconstitution and ultimately memorialization of um, the victims. So a thing I didn't mention when I was speaking about the, um, the figures, the individual figures, they're all named after victims. So there's for Michael, uh, there's for Philando, for Sandra, and so on. But the seated warrior, um, that large female figure that we were looking at, that is this infinite tabernacle, she's the warrior. She is the god, she's the protector of all of these other figures. So she is battle worn. You could see her arm and her leg are missing, but she's still there, regal and basically sentient and protective of those spirits. So for me, this is really couched in a language and my own interpretation of many different cultural and spiritual practices and an attempt to make some sense of you know, the atrocity that I, you, all of us literally witness almost on a daily, definitely on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Um, Sanford, I just want to let you know, I think um, folks are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. And so if you could um, turn up your volume, maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm really struck by um, the, you know, the, bron the bronze figure that is, um, you know, that has, that's, that's injured, right? That is um, at once incomplete. Um, but also, you know, kind of um, that stands beautiful with its with with her scars, right? Um, and to me, that just seems, you know, sort of in thinking about visualizing abolition, um, it seems like such an important, um, you know, an an important thing to remember uh, that we um, that the the route to, you know, to freedom in a sense, right? It doesn't mean that we um, somehow abandon all of our, um, you know, that we arrive with our scars, right? That we arrive with, um, you know, with the histories that are, are um, uh, you know, that we've been marked with um, and how we kind of address those traumas. Um, and I, I just found it also really um, important that it becomes a kind of communal ritual for you, right? Um, mm -hmm. can I ask you, you know, what it means, we were talking about the, the work, um, in the museum, right? Um, and it's, you know, struck by, um, the conversation that Nicole Fleetwood and Nick Mirzoff and Herman Gray were having, had in November as part of this series, um, in which Nicole and Nick reminded us that the prison and the museum, and I would also add the archive, right, all emerge in the same moment. Um, and so, you know, what is it, you know, this kind of the significance of doing, you were talking about this sort of the museological, um, but the significance of uh, engaging these materials um, in, in a museum setting. Right? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, um, as many um, other people probably feel, um, there was a long time that it was hard to feel welcome in certain museums. 
And that might have been an attitude of staff. It might have been um, the shows that were being presented. Um, and just the way the culture of the museum has not been the most inviting for people who are outside of a certain sort of elitist class. And um, I'd say from the very beginning of my projects, my, you know, my career as an artist um, over 20 years ago, was always finding ways to infiltrate. And this is coming off the heels of a lot of institutional critique. You know, Fred Wilson is definitely mm -hmm. comes to mind right off the bat. But um, artists that were finding new ways, not only to just reinterpret the content of the museum, but reinterpret or reestablish re our relationship with museums. Mm -hmm. So I did an early body of work, which were mandalas. Um, and they were hand cut mandalas that I made out of, um, you know, uh, surplus rubber tiles. And it created these elaborate mandala floors that were later used as dance floors for break dancers. Mm -hmm. And I would invite the break dancers to the museums or the venues where it was and um, capture the entire dance or the battle with an overhead video camera. And then I would place these in museums and preferably an encyclopedic museum that had a contemporary wing because I was really not just making a project of, of contemporary art, I was also making a critique of how objects from primary cultures have been taken and um, usually, um, you know, put under the vitrine, like we mentioned before, and taken out of their use context. Mm -hmm. So I was finding a way to bring these brown bodies into the museum, not just to perform, but also to bring their friends to be an audience, so that it was basically a takeover. And those pieces would go to various museums around the world, and I would make relation, um, you know, deals with those museums to let people come in and dance on that dance floor um, a few times a week. So once again, to sort of cut down, cut down the boundary between viewing the art and experiencing the art. So, you know, you might walk into a museum in Paris on a Wednesday and see a bunch of people doing tango on the dance floor. That's totally fine. Because when that piece goes to its next, next venue, those scuff marks tell the story of where it's been and create its own sort of contemporary ethnography, if you will. Um, once again, a place of communion. I mean, these are underlying themes that I think really are in many of my different um, pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also love the, the sense too of like, not only um, infiltrating the museum, right, but also that the, as a thing, right, the tabernacle is the, the place of congregation is also um, movable, right? And, and necessarily kind of has to be um, mobile in certain kinds of ways, right? And I think this sense of, um, you know, where do we, where where do we find home? Where do we find, you know, kind of safety and belonging? And I think, you know, it's sort of in in the process. I think in a lot of ways around the kind of the the making of the work, right, and the coming together around it. I think we have there's um, in the slideshow there um, are at least one of the mandalas. Um, Maybe Chloe, you could forward a little bit. Also, I would mention that even the uh, way that those um, screens are presented in the corner on that rug was really influenced by seeing roadside altars and altars and shrines made inside of trees and in nature in various um, places, countries that I've been. So there is sort of a provisional, as you mentioned, uh, mobile uh, nature to it that it could be moved and still serve its spiritual and connective purposes. Um, and that the museum or the gallery almost becomes secondary. The piece can live outside of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can show that as a version of a mandala as well. I don't know if we have any of the floor pieces. No, I don't know if we, yeah, okay. I don't know that we, that we do. Um, but I mean, going along with that theme of like these spiritual devices, this piece right here, if you go to the image before that, can we go back one? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that piece right there is called Lotus. And you know, many people know that the, the idea of a Lotus in Buddhism is it's a, a symbol for purity of wholeness of completion, peace, tranquility, and so on. Um, that comes from the muck and mire of a pond or a lake and then rises to the top and becomes this beautiful blossom. So this is my version of a Lotus blossom. But if we go to the next slide, you can tell as you get closer to that Lotus, each of those petals are actually cross sections of slave ships. So it's a very seductive and beautiful object on one level, but the closer you get to it, you start to see the horror and the terror that's actually embedded right there, you know, etched right into the glass. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the fact that this, this is around seven and a half feet diameter. So it's, you know, 
larger than life to a degree. And as people walk around it, you see them through the glass, implying all of us in this transaction and this history and so on. Because, you know, I, I always say this when I talk about this piece, it's not strictly about American slavery in America. It's about enslavement, period. And using this as a way to find a universal way of addressing some of those issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm really um, I'm struck by how you are able to hold, um, hold beauty and terror, right? Uh, together, um, how, and sort of, um, you know, uh, that whether it's the terror that draws us in first, um, and then imprints the, the sort of impresses us with beauty, or it's the beauty in this piece, right, that, that then holds the, the terror. And it's just, and I think, you know, can you, um, it, it seems to me the kind of, you um, uh, your investment in kind of multiple meanings of any, um, you know, uh, material or history, um, or maybe I guess maybe it's like an irreverence to a certain extent for um, history and historical process um, that enables you to kind of move in this place. And so, I mean, how how does how does history work for you in your um, in your in your process? Well, I mean, I think history is an amazing material. Um, I think we have instances where history itself seems like a malleable um, <laughs> object or, you know, something that can be used, manipulated, reshaped and reconfigured to tell the story of whoever's telling it at that given point. You know, we often say that history is written by the victors, but I think we're at a point where I start to consider history as being open source. So that gives us all the ability to sort of cherry pick, if you will. And mm -hmm. I know it's sort of a risky proposition, but I feel a lot more comfortable doing it myself than having someone else do it to me. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, and then there's tension. <laughs> and then there's tension. I, I, I like the tension of, yeah, there is beauty, but there's something darker there, or there's something dark there, but there's something seductive there. It's never, you know, one particular path. I think of it as a both and, as opposed to a either or scenario. Um, beauty and horror are not necessarily opposites. Um, so, you know, I embrace that in the work and I, you know, history is not necessarily, or not, history is not necessarily factual. Um, so um, I like playing with that. I like taking liberties with that. Well, and I, you know, and I think the, when you, um, we lost you for a minute and before you came back, um, you know, we started to sort of talk about the, um, at least, you know, my work in photography, right, is like this kind of investment in um, what, what the image can tell us about, you know, the, the factual work of the image, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and I think that's been a really um, uh, important part of Black political struggle, uh, but it's also been a detriment um, in a lot of ways, right? Um, in the sense that, um, you know, on one hand, it kind of, um, you know, denies, um, it denies, uh, can often deny some of the other senses, right? Mm -hmm. um, that sort of a primacy for the visual, um, as opposed to you know uh, the sonic, the, uh, um, the oral, the you know sense of smell or sense of taste, um, and I think also it um, you know if we understand blackness itself as a kind of a way of seeing that structures um, us away in a sense from facts, um, right? That we can't um, you know like understand like the, the data um, is only, you know, going to kind of produce exactly the same, you know, horrible structural results. Um, then, you know, what are our, what are the tools then that we use in kind of, you know, um, around visuality? Um, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, it was, um, would love for you to talk maybe about, you um, uh, the, the place of abstraction in your work and the move away from the fig figural. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think there is that aspect of the factual, obviously, as uh, we mentioned with, you know, photography and even history, mm -hmm. but then there's the perceptual as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in seeing how you can play with the way people perceive a work and taking into consideration that everyone's bringing their own personal experience to that perception in the first place. Mm -hmm. So optimally, I am trying to make works that have people converse so that person A, person B, and person C can see the same piece and have totally different perceptions and understandings of that work. Mm -hmm. Optimally, they'd have a conversation and enlighten all in that group of A, B, and C. So that's really what it's about. It's like, oh, I didn't see that. Thank you for opening my eyes to that. Or I didn't know that. That makes me see this in a different way. So um, to me, that's really an inspiration and something to strive for in the work. And I think where abstraction comes in is because that's one of the only ways that I can make sense of the world that I live in. I can't take things um, at face value. And there's a sort of there's atrocities and there's absurdities that we deal with on a daily basis. And I think abstraction is one way to deal with that because it doesn't posit itself as oppositional to one thing, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's almost what you're alluding to when we're talking about how we perceive uh, photographs and history. In our case, it's often seen in, it's defined by its opposition to some degree. Mm -hmm. And abstraction is a way of blurring that because there's not one specific thing that it's opposed to. In fact, it might be opposed to many things or blend into many things. Once again, I think it's the perception of the viewer to disentangle that. And that investment of time and thought is really the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, let's maybe um, we can talk about some of the, the quilt pieces and that series, because I think that um, you know, those works are doing exactly you know, it, it, um, the question of blurring and the invitation to multiple modes of seeing. I mean, Talk to us about your the, the series, the code switch sure. series. Um, can we start with, um, can you find another one before we go into that three-dimensional one? Because uh, yeah, I think that could ground us a little bit. Um, yeah, so I started working with um, found um, and acquired quilts, antique quilts specifically, pre-1900, um, you know, close to a decade ago while I was doing a project in Philadelphia. And while I was getting ready for that installation, I came across two different quilting exhibitions and learned about their supposed use along the Underground Railroad as signposts for um, you know, uh, escaping enslaved people. And if quilts were folded a certain way or displayed a certain pattern or were located a certain place on a premises, it gave signals of whether that safe house was open or if it was under surveillance or maybe even map directions and so on. Now, once again, um, this has been batted back and forth between historians of whether or not it really happened, but it does exist as vernacular history, and there's merit to that as well. At least as an artist, there's definitely merit to that. That's a great starting point. So I started to think, if there's code already embedded in quilts, what does it mean for me to then put another layer of code hundreds of years after the initial code was on there? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the conceptual ideas behind working with the quilts, but the quilt itself is so charged, it's highly charged. There's the aspect of labor or creation of who made them. When were they made? Where were they made? What purpose did they serve? They are sculptural by nature. They're performative by nature because they exist in relationship to bodies, whether we see that body or not. So I liked how it implied the figure without necessarily displaying the figure. And then I find that my interventions then become a way of either unlocking or complicating geometric codes and visual illusions and trompe l'oeil and so on when you know I intervene with each one. Uh, the one you're seeing right now uh, is a very recent one um, and it is called Orpheus. And it's figurative but not, it's uh, shamanic but not, it's everything and nothing. And I think to me, that is sort of that process of abstraction. You have the ability to see worlds within this piece mm -hmm. um, with the means that it's made, you know? And at the end of the day, it's a collage of several materials that are over a hundred years old. And my dream is that someone who sees this a hundred years from now, now has a palimpsest of a cross-generational uh, palimpsest of American history that traverses multiple centuries. Mm -hmm. 
I love I um I love that sense of not just a, a, a palimpsest but the intergenerational conversation and collaboration um, because I've been thinking more and more um, you know that has been that that part of the work of, of um, black memory or engaging with history ha is this question of um, not necessarily correcting you know the wrong the you know a wrong story um, but is about a kind of um, uh, you know a kind of intergenerational healing right and a kind of like speaking um, you know uh, a, a recognition of like the kind of frequencies in which um, you know the ancestors <laughs> were speaking were speaking to us are speaking to us right um, and I you know, love the way this you know you know these pieces they vibrate um, and so I'm curious how much um, you know, because I think what's coming up over and over is um, your sense of the time that you spend with these, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, whether it's the sculptures um, or the antique quilts, right? The process of gathering um, and collecting and kind of listening, right, um, to what they're, you know, what they're, the 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 energy is, right, before you make the decision about what what will be next and so can you just talk a little bit about um you know what what the process of collecting is like and, and what and, and and how you listen i guess yeah um, i think that is definitely um something that is visible in a lot of my work is that notion of the time i spent you know collecting the figures for the bam series <clears throat> collecting the references for the marble works collecting the quilts and the additional materials that go into this, uh, the, what I call the codex series. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I could sit around with a quilt and I usually sit around with these quilts for several months at a time before I can make a mark on them because it is a dance. It's not solo authorship. It's not me taking a blank canvas and imparting my will on it. It's more of, a, you know, once again, a cross-generational collaboration, but also a sensitivity to what's happening in each individual quilt, how each material reacts to other paints or tar or glitter, um, drying time, strength and durability, line pitch by way of stitching and how bold is the stitch and how minimal is the stitch, how can I bring it out? You know, so it's very technical on a lot of levels. So. Um, the time spent on these, um, there's been, unfortunately, none of them have been done very quickly. <laughs> um, they can take weeks to months. Some have taken years. Um, but I think the other aspect of time is that I think what you see in the end between all these works is not being able to posit any of them in one particular time. And that's really the goal. You know, once again, this is another one of my objectives. So that you look at it and you don't know exactly what year it might have been made. So, um, you know, I think that's another way of fucking with history, basically, is to sort of being almost ahistorical in a sense or operating outside of the linear aspect of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the funny part is like, you know, um, on one hand, this whole conversation makes me twitchy, right, as a historian. <laughs> Right. As, I do. I'm saying that every time, and I'm just like <laughs> huh? thinking, I'm like, oh, God, I'm like, just getting under your skin. <laughs> no, and, but like, but that's you know, but that's also what a process of change looks like, right? Like of transformation is like, you know, how you wrestle wrestle with the ideas that that um, actually are the most most difficult, right? For like, and so you know, so thinking about like. Because on one hand, right, I'm like, I want to believe in, um, you know, in the, it, like, there is, there is an importance in saying things happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, at least, you know, like in my training, right? But at mm -hmm. the same time, we also know that, you know, as you've pointed out, that collection, the collection of like, you know, of historical facts and, and, and nuggets are so highly fraught, shaped, um, you know, wielded against us um, in, you know, all of these, you know, 
horrific ways. I was thinking about Du Bois talking about like, and here come the sociologists gleefully counting the bastards and prostitutes, right? Like that's the work of data collection. And so the necessary work of like undoing, unseeing, remaking. Um, and I think there's something to me, like like your process and the kind of the the breadth of materials, right? Is that this is, um, you know, it's all of the ways of kind of like, you know, stitching, um, you know, a potential history, right? Stitching a new way, like another way of, of imagining. Um, and I guess this is all of me, you know, the question that I've been thinking about in terms of visualizing, ab visualizing abolition are, are kind of like, what are all the things that we have to refuse in order um, and that we have to unthink in order to make an abolitionist future, right? In order to kind of imagine, um, you know, a, a different way of, of living, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think, um, and literally, right, the kind of the work of you, of stitching, right? Mm -hmm. Of that, of the fabric, the, 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 the tendril that, 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 um, you know, uh, is reordering our our relationship to space and time. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think it's sort of up to it's some it rests somewhere in between what you do and what I do. Um, I'm trying to sort of explode the the um, the linearity of history mm -hmm. in a nonsensical type of way only so that when we learn aspects of history, we get the information, we take it for what it's worth, and we do not get too stuck on it because we have to go about the work of changing it for the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a position as an artist using my tools to posit these ideas that you know it's malleable and it doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. with full recognition of the power of what history actually is. So I couldn't do what I do without you doing what you do. Um, but with that being said, it's somewhere in between what we both do to try to figure out a way out of what has already happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm less interested in making work that ends up being didactic and illustrative of that because it will only be read in relationship to that. So I'm trying to find a way to use these tools to confuse, to uh, complicate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's, the, <laughs> what's the thing that you felt like you've had to, you know, the hardest thing for you to unlearn or let go? Mm. Um, I think too much. I'm trying my best to stop thinking so much. Um, and I know this is probably a lifetime pursuit. And some days I get that levity where I trust the hands and I trust um, the years of working to you know, let my body do what it does without the mind getting too involved, but my mind gets involved. So that's one thing I'm trying to uh, use use as sparingly <laughs> as possible, depending on what the project is. Um, I also like to say that I front load things. I like to do a lot of the thinking on the front end so that on the back end, I can just play. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, not to avoid that question, but I think it's very interesting that right behind you, there is a large book that on the spine shows the scarification on the back of the slave that they call Gordon the slave. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the quilt that's on the screen right now, that literally is the silhouette of that exact same character mm -hmm. minus the lashings, where it's just the uh, sort of negative imprint of the body. And in this context, it almost looks like he's a landowner sitting casually and looking over his land. Mm -hmm. And years ago, I started to think of those scars on the back of Gordon, the slave, as constellations. Maybe that lattice work of scarification somehow is a map to a better future. Mm -hmm. And starting to look at those scars as constellations and putting them on the quilt was considering the stitching and the lines and the cross hatching is also part of that, that narrative. So I just had to point that out. Yeah, no, um, I mean, go ahead, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, no, go ahead. yeah, no, I mean, I, it's, it's, you know, um, I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm always fascinated by, or like what, what photographs, 
we return to, right, um, mm -hmm. over and over again. Um, but that we don't want to, um, you know, th that photograph of Gordon in its originary moment, right, was made to perform a particular kind of work, right, and it needed needed to to demonstrate the brutality, literally the brutality of slavery written on on black bodies, right, and black people's flesh. Mm -hmm. Um, but all of the kinds of, um, you know, the, the journey of that photograph across, you know, 150 or, you know, nearly 200 years, um, it need we need it to, to, to do different work, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Without, with, but the work is not to, um, you know, entirely eliminate it or ignore that photograph or that history, right? Um, you know, and you know, I look at this. I mean, and again, I'm looking at it on my screen. Um, but thinking about, um, you know, the kinds of um, the way that it's 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 dripping, right? Like the kind of um, and the the uh, so you know, it feels like you said constellation i mean i i'm just you know thinking about like what is the what's the map through the terrain like what's the terrain that we're traversing right um and you know and i think it's just like um you know i think part of like a practice of you know an aesthetic of abolition is also about you know certainly kind of um uh in some ways not being so precious about these histories and right reactivate him. And I think it's also really key, and maybe this would be a good time we could turn to moon um, moon medicine, because I think one of the things that you, you know, I'm also thinking about this as a quilt with a body, you know, with Gordon on it, but that, um, you know, that can be, you know, um, that can be draped over someone, right, that can, um, that becomes an act of care, right, um, and warmth and comfort. Um, so yeah, let's, oh, we didn't talk about Blossom. Okay. But, um, but will you just, um, kind of set, set this up for us a little bit? Sure. And um, so this is a, uh, video piece that I did with Moon Medicine and with the director, Terrence Nance, who's, um, a good and old friend of mine where we, um, uh, basically, um, we shot this video for a song called The Great Escape. And The Great Escape, basically, the lyrics, as you'll hear, um, some of it is dealing with a lot of the stuff that we have just been speaking about. The quilt that we just looked at actually makes an appearance in this video. Um, and for me, the process of you know composing this song and this video is in some way chipping away at the same block that I think the art does, but through a different means. Like we talked about um, the sonic and the visual, the photographic, the sculptural, um, this is yet another way of chipping away at the same block and dismantling aspects of the history, reimagining aspects of the history, um, and projecting it into, you know, some type of forward and different outcome. Um, so there's a reverence for the past. So don't let, you know, there is a reverence and a deference for the past, but there's also a reclamation of that, you know, um, in my work. And I think that all also does have some tension. And I think that tension is, is a positive tension and a, a potent tension. So um, yeah, let's go, we'll go ahead and play it. Um, I think it's around a two or three minute clip. So if we do have to cut it short, I understand for time. Born and raised in the South. She had many jobs, one of them being a slave. She wanted to escape, but she knew it wouldn't be easy. He polishes his suit and tie, he 
Your smile is a lie. The die is cast, the metal forms, they're drunk off the high. But little do they realize he's counting on time. He's ready. It's dry by the day. There's life in their bed. Scoffing at the bourbon sun that left them for dead. The coated quilt has given word. The train leaves tonight. They're ready. beautiful to see the quilts in motion um, and to see them to see them charged in that way um, I think I'm gonna it's now time I'm gonna invite um, uh, Rachel and Gina to come back um, and then I think we're gonna move to uh, audience questions Hi, thank you. That such a beautiful <laughs> such a beautiful conversation and a quiet one between you two. Um, I I am interested in thinking more about some of the themes that have emerged, especially um, the distinctions that were being made between history and memory and a kind of recursivity in the relationship to history where drawing back through um, history and uh, figuring actually history in that way um, through objects and also in the film. But I actually wanted to um, raise a question from one of our UC colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, Bridget Cooks has written in. And so I'm just gonna read it to you. Uh, she has a greeting to you as well. Hi, Leanne Stam Sanford. Thank you for this conversation that I've been looking forward to. Is it possible that the artist and historian are working with frameworks of time that show linearity, cyclical repetition and remixes? I think both are involved in creating black time, a temporality in which we don't know what time it is because we don't figure into linear figurations of progress. Thank you. Yeah, that's brilliant Bridget as always. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sam Sanford, do you want to jump in? I mean, I mean, that was just so beautifully stated. Um, I don't know how much I could really add to that, but um, yeah, I really don't. Um, I'm thinking of that, and it makes me float. It makes me feel that time is actually all around, mm -hmm. and we're floating within it. And to some degree, we can swim and navigate through it the way we want. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that might actually go back to one of your earlier questions is how I'm dealing with um, some of this loaded history and these things that are, you know, um, charged and can rub people many different ways. But I think my intention 
what dealing it is really to find a way for us to be able to float and flow freely within it and through it and past it. You know, and I think um, one of the challenges for me sort of coming to um, coming to the visual through photography, right, um, is the way in which I think photography has disciplined, um, you know, dif in, in some ways, f the photograph fits at the nexus of, right, the archive, the museum, um, in a sense, the prison, right, as these kind of, you know, the, the, the visual mode of classification and order and itself as imposing a kind of temporality, a specific kind of um, temporality. And a lot of the kind of like unlearning that I've been doing in the last um, you know, few years is trying to, um, to think more about how uh, the photograph, as you say, Sam, how it floats in time, right? How it can actually enable us, right? To, um, uh, you know, to kind of throw off, right? Like, um, you know, exactly those kinds of impositions um, of order, of discipline, um, you know, and that is, and so, you know, so for me, part of it is, is also trying to think through, like, um, you know, if we're trying to think, think about a, um, an aesthetics, um, of abolition, right? In some ways, like, um, you know, what is the, does the photograph have a place, um, in that, um, in that conceptualization or what is the place, um, potentially of the photograph? And so I'm really, you know, so thinking about, you know, the way you've incorporated um, Gordon, right? Um, you know, is uh, and your use of, um, you know, an engagement with film. But I, you know, I think film does moves in a different, you know, space time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I think this is, you know, for me the like the photograph is often, in many ways, like the, you know, it's the conundrum. Right. Um, it's a um, it, it's both an opportunity and a possibility because it move it, it moves through time, but it's also um, the um, you know it, it wants to like I feel like it always also wants to, to impose its place its its space time on us. How how do you see that um, in relation to how folk photography is used today, the ubiquity of photography? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, and I guess, you know, it's like, you know, in, in what way, right? Like, and I think there, or whose use of photography, right? So I think on one hand, um, you know, I think we inherit the kinds of, um, the kind of history of photography that, um, and the, you know, uh, the sort of early photographic uses, not just like, in the portrait, but also for, um, you know, uh, you know, science for, um, you know, for the carceral state, right? Um, we inherit all of those, right? Um, and this kind of, a certain kind of belief in the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the truth supposedly that the photograph can bring. Um, but I think the the sheer proliferation, right, and of people like engaging in in photography on a daily basis, um, is um, on one hand can disrupt that, right? Is disrupting that, um, or is you know t tuning us into a different kind of knowledge that the photograph can offer, um, or that we seek from the photograph, uh, or from photography. Um, but at the same time, I think that, um, uh, you know, there's still a kind of, um, and maybe, you know, the, it's not as much, it's um, the kind of the mapping on of, the, of photography to the truth of black, of black people, black bodies, right? Like what, what we're supposed to represent, um, which is part of my interest in um, abstraction as kind of, um, as you said, blurring the lines, freeing us um, from 
that kind of that those kinds of um, certain kinds of imposition. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I keep thinking about and have thought about repeatedly, I think, throughout the time that I've thought about your work, Sanford, but also in relationship to everything that you're saying today about history, Lee, is about the role of belief, right? Because I think that Sanford, you know, you point towards kind of spirituality and belief over and over and over again. And one of the things we were talking that has come out really clear today, that what we believe about history as is important as what actually is, right? Yeah. And so I wondered if you wanted to both talk, you know, and you just said belief again, Lee, I was like, yeah, this is all about the belief, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how to change the registers or to think about belief in these really deep ways that Infinite Tabernacle asks us to do, that you know, all of these things do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll let you start with that one. About belief? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm in a moment of, um, you know, um, actually, I, I'm not ready to answer this one yet. I'm going to, I need to. <laughs> yeah, that's complicated. It's really complicated. Um, I think that's tied into why I asked you that question about the ubiquity of photography and notions of belief, because I can't help but think of the proliferation of photography now and think of disbelief or constructed beliefs or multiple beliefs. Um, and you, you had a phrase earlier where you were talking about how photography was used and can it do, can the image of even Gordon do the same thing today as what it did back then? Or is it, yeah, it needs to do something different today. And I, I just can't help but think about how many people are snapping images and how we're inundated by them and how do they register to us? Um, because they have to register to some degree for us to believe or we're in a place where we just don't believe anything. So. I don't exactly know how to answer that too, but I do feel that, that we're in a place right now where we are being conditioned, not we necessarily, everyone in this panel, I think we come from different generations and different, different histories, for lack of a better word, with photographic imagery. But I think for generations, subsequent generations and generations that grew up on the internet and so on, that the power and the use potential of the photographic image has changed and people are getting conditioned. I don't know if it's to see less or see more. Maybe it's to see more, but not to perceive more. Maybe it's perceiving less and seeing more. I don't know, but there's a desensitization, I think, that's happening with the explosion of sensationalization. It's very complicated. I gotta work this out. <laughs> well, but I think, you know, and maybe I think, you know, the proliferation for me is about, um, is about time, right? Is about time and breath, right? And, um, you know, and which is why I was, you know, really wanting to actually hear more about the time that you spend, right? With, you know, with your materials um, and how you're con conceptualizing the works, because I think that, um, you know, what we have, the inundation, is that we don't get the chance we're processing so quickly we're seeing so much all the time and i think at least for me where belief comes um, or where a kind of like spiritual practice comes is um like what it means to slow down and and look and look slowly right and look carefully and keep looking um and not in a way that's just you know, um, you know, and, and I think this is, you know, I miss, I miss, that's the thing that I, I think I miss most um, about, you know, like being in the world is that, um, you know, it's a very different experience standing in front of, um, you know, standing in front of a quilt as opposed to trying to, you know, like, like how close can I get to my screen? Um, but I think that is, um, you know, for me is like, you know, somebody asked about the question of like unthinking and unlearning. And I think even like a lot of that is about um, slowing down so that I can even process what it is that I, you know, all of the things that we've been taught 
to um, that we, we don't even uh, get a chance to, to to unpack in our perceptions, right? Um, so you know all of the um, you know yeah. So I think that's that's for me is like I think so much of um, what the kind of invitation um, and the and the urgency the urgency is to slow down, right? To imagine you know how we can um, you know live more abundantly and collectively, right? Could I ask you all to um, talk more about practice? And the reason I'm thinking in this is I, I was struck by, Sanford, you're talking about the problem of thinking um, and the problem, you know, and for, from coming from an artist, it, ha it makes sense. But I think unpacking that a little bit and I'm, I'm setting this alongside what Lee was just talking about, about the proliferation of um, all of us as photographers or as making photographs, but it's a different modality. A lot of times I think we relate to those photographs as information. Uh, and so I just wonder if the two of you might tease out uh, what it might be to think abolition through these different practices, um, which are um, not then about uh, what Sanford was saying earlier, you issue as didacticism, um, which is often the kind of political go-to, right? That we, we, we know the answer, we, we say what there is, but of course this whole series is really about drawing out different practices, some which are culturally submerged and, and don't um, really get popularized, um, others which are historical and have been suppressed, uh, especially in the cultures of Black peoples. Um, so I just wonder if maybe we could dwell on, on uh, habit, practice, and what role that might play in getting to a different place. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, what I was saying about thinking, and I think, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure everyone was following me with that, but um, there's so much thought that goes and, and time that goes into my process of literally just sitting there and living with any material that I'm working with at any given time. It's an extremely time consuming endeavor. And part of me wants to turn off the thinking just to bask in that time even more because the thinking, I end up putting more constraints on myself. You know what I mean? Um, expectations and taking away from the pure joy of just materiality and tactility and all of those things. But I think another word that I'd like to put in there is also vulnerability. And I think that comes with time and thinking and allowing things to slow down, especially in a day when we're so conditioned to just go, 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 go. Slowing down is an opportunity to actually really have to process things. And that can be a vulnerable and um, scary, premise for a lot of us, you know what I mean? Um, and it's ironic to even think that way because we're in lockdown, yet still there seems to be a desire for us to speed up and speed up, speed up as a default. <laughs> um, so I think that vulnerability is part and parcel with that idea of time and idea of thought. Um, I think it's extremely valid and I hope it's, lot, it's not a lost art, but I think in relationship to abolition, it's also being vulnerable. It's also taking risks. It's also the pain. It's also the scars. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy process. It's not an overnight process. And I think part of it is being willing to put the time, thought, and vulnerability into something that you may not even see the result of, mm -hmm. but having belief that generations after you may see that. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I am laughing in part because um, right, like as a um, like for imagine for Gina, Rachel, and I, right, like our training um, in you know in the academy is one of um, really disciplining vulnerability mm -hmm. out of what we do, right? <laughs> um, it is the assertion of mastery. It is the, you know embrace of um you know like the, the time of racial capitalism right um so everything um and that is, is it right and this is the conversation we were having a little bit earlier rachel it's just like right that we are meant to kind of produce data 
right? And, you know, produce facts. And so, um, you know, and so, so much of, um, you know, and I think, right, this sort of embrace, like an embrace of, to go back to Bridget's point, question about black time, right? So much of that is also, it's the, you know, it's the time of the maroon. It is the time of, um, you know, of the future. It is the time of, um, you know, of just <laughs> like, and actually, I think I go like, for me, what's sort of most emblematic is actually um, the moment in the beginning of Infinite Tabernacle before um, before we see any, after the, the gunshot, but before we see any mm -hmm. figure, right? Any sculpture, right? It's the sunlight and the, I forget, you know, Brownian motion of just things, right? That's the kind of, um, almost it's the dream time, right? That is exactly the place we want to be, right? Or I think that I am trying to get to so that I can imagine what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, so a lot of it is just, um, you know, so thinking about practice, like I was thinking about, you know, like, for some some people, art is art is like you know it's a it's a vocation, and I think yours is a you know it is a practice of living, right? And mm -hmm. so, and thinking about then what that frees us up to feel and do and move in the how we you know move in the world, and so you know even just like you know when we went to online or remote teaching initially, and I could hear the the kind of the panic like the you know every class are my students were just this tension the anxiety rising and because i mean anxiety is not is like so much of living in a future time right of like what you have no control over um, and you, you don't know what's coming um and realizing that we needed to start class with just breathing right yeah. And I think, you know, um, and that's, that's also been part of the unlearning. And that feels like a, these small, really small steps towards something, you know, you know so, towards something better, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the questions that was written in that I just want to work back to was really thinking about this in terms of forgetting. Like what, what, is there a role for forgetting or do we have do all these little bits of knowledge and things need to come along? Hmm. In the undoing of thinking. And the first thing I think of is that forgetting is almost a privilege to some degree. Um, I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's wonderful to forget. It's wonderful to actually be able to holistically let something go. And now that that question has been posed, I don't know how effectively or how often I even can do that or that I have done that. Because um, <laughs> I wouldn't remember, I guess. But <laughs> but it seems like something to work towards. <laughs> the ability to be able to forget. Because that means you're truly done. It's truly gone. you know. Um, and it opens up. I mean... I think of the metaphor I've got for that is basically think of thinking of infinite tabernacle as seeming as if it's a destructive thing, but in my opinion, it's a generative thing. And forgetting is also not necessarily letting something totally go. It's actually opening up a door to experience more, letting more memories and more experience come in. Um, forget, yeah. I'm going to put that on my list for 2021. Let's forget some things. It's time to forget some things. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I mean, I agree that, right, like, one of the, um, you know, sort of, I, I think, a, a privilege of, of um, whiteness or, you know, uh, white supremacy is the, is, right, has been, like, colonial amnesia, right, historical amnesia. Um, and in many ways, right, Black folks have, um, you know, it's people of long memory, right, of kind of, um, holding on and, 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 and recounting, um, you know, um, and I, and I think, 
And I, you know, I, I really hear what you're saying, Sanford, because I think there's so much that that's also, um, you know, it's so powerful and important and it's also uh, a burden that we carry, right? It's also this kind of, you know, the, the fear of, um, you know, these yep. practices, these histories, these people, right? Our answers who will be forgotten, right? Um, and so, you know, and so I think that there's, um, you know, again, sort of going back to the question, like stitching, right? Like what, what, what happens when you're literally enfolding them into, um, you know, into work. And I, I guess, I, I guess I would ask, I would want to, you know, so, you know, remembering what are we remembering for what, um, to what end, like, what is the, the, the work of what we need to remember? Um, and, um, because I also think that, right, like, um, there's a certain kind of, uh, like, if, again, if we go back to the, the emergence of the museum and the archive, right, that is the impulse to, you know, to not forget, even as you eliminate the people whose culture and objects you have, you know, stolen and are holding on to so vociferously. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I'm, I, um, again, I think I'm, I'm in it, like, I'm trying to, to think through this question of like, you know, what, what do, um, the invitation to let go, right? Um, we're taught, never forget. And we're also taught to forget is to let yourself vulnerable to be rudely awakened and rudely reminded of your status in a country that doesn't see you as equal. You know, and when it comes down to that, so in some way, you know, to forget is a privilege and to forget is actually rebellious um, and provokes a degree of anxiety. Isn't that horrible? I'm actually, you know, that's a great question. That was a really good question. Hmm. Well, I don't think we want to um, close only on anxiety. But I will take that as an information, as an invitation to close on um, memory in a, in a different way. And as you were talking about Sanford earlier, um, making space for us to have um, other memories. Um, mm -hmm. And you both have been so generous in doing that for us tonight. So first of all, we want to thank you. And, um, and we have a bit of a gift for you in the form of a video that's come to us from the Music for Abolition series. And so tonight, that video um, comes to us from Nicole Mitchell Gant, and it's called Abolition Think Tank. It's a shared exploration of concrete steps needed to move past our present punitive culture led by three incarceration veterans, Zadiq Davis, Richard Garland, and James Baduel, who actively worked to facilitate positive societal re-entry for others. It has film, music, and editing by Nicole Mitchell Gant, and spoken word by Sadiq Davis, Richard Garland, and James Baduel. I want to thank you all for joining us. Please enjoy our video. Uh, a lot of my friends and co-gang members, and they live in a bad way, uh, and I know. I don't want any thoughts of that, so I'm doing everything within my power to try to bring them out of that by uh, trying to renew, God willing, the way I'm thinking. So that's to have been with me. So even in our music, we think that if we can change the language, we can change the behavior. So that's why our music is so important. I think that changing the language is extremely important. Uh, apart from changing the language, uh, I see it changing, changing the way you think, you know, so before we can reimagine outside, we have to reimagine inside and the way that we feel about ourselves, the way that we see ourselves, because it was extremely hard to, to get work, and when we did get work, uh, we'll get the job, and then eventually HR would say, well, you come in the background, came back, so you, you can't do this job anymore. Uh, it was extremely hard to get housing with a, with a 720 credit score. 
Some of the most intelligent people that I know are behind those walls. They were my teachers. They was the ones who motivated me to give back. Let these little brothers go. You know, let them go to try to find something different in life. These little brothers got children and things of that nature. You know, we need to teach them how to be better fathers, not how to be on security. And if they love you more than they love their children, they're in a bad spot. Proof is, is called the people's right to obtain our freedom and uh, proof, you know, that, you know, we talk about not being able to get jobs. We talk about not being able to get housing. One thing that I realized is that it's not against the law to get jobs. It's not against the law to get housing. So how is it possible that we can come out of the country and not get it? And it's called the common law, is that if that's how people feel, then that's just the way it goes. And so how do we go about that? You know, don't we deserve to have as well? And of course we do, you know. And so through working with the NAACP uh, and learning about civil rights and fighting for our civil rights, you know, doing what our ancestors have done, I've also uh, learned that civil rights are great and we need that. Uh, other countries are actually fighting for more. They're fighting for their human rights, which we as black people often say we don't have, you know, um, which is very important. You know, uh, we all know that we came from the creator, uh, whoever that might be, the people. And so how do we start to stand on that? You know, how do we start to have a more positive reinforce, re re reinforcing identity about ourselves? Then not fighting from a place of... Uh, since somebody did something to me, I'm going to start fighting that instead of me saying that, okay, this is what I want for my life and I'm going to go for that, but not looking to nobody at all. We're looking solely based on the energy that we have because we already are together. We already are a people. We already are human beings. You know, I, I know that my life is important. And so I believe that reframing the lens in which that we look at it to say that, okay, uh, 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 Rosa Parks, you know, that was a civil rights icon. That's what a lot of people say, but I say she was a human rights icon. She had some determination. The right of self-determination is a human right, that you have the right to determine where you go, where you sit, where you sleep, how you move. That's a human right. And so what would it look like for us to start to reframe how we move based on human rights and not civil rights? Because civil rights is something that uh, put us inside of a condition where the government told us that this is who we are. So Marcus Garvey said, up, up, your mighty race, achieve what you will. You know, no man deserves respect unless he do those things with the respect. And the black community, the black people in general, us as a whole, we have to understand that nobody makes it if we all gonna make it together. That's point blank, period. I said earlier, and I keep saying the most intelligent, some of the most intelligent people I know are behind the wall. Uh, and those are my teachers. Those are the ones who, who taught me how important it is to give back and raise up next young man or woman that's coming up. The young people, I, I wanted to change their, their, their way of thinking. As I said, I want to change the narrative. taking the public health approach to uh, uh, violence, uh, interrupting the transmission of the disease, because that's the way I look at, at violence now, that is disease. So what we do is try to interrupt the transmission of the disease. And also one of the things is, the most important thing to me is changing community norms. If we can change community norms, we can change, we can change society. And then it's identity transformation. Who we used to be, you know, people respect us for what we used to be, but they really respect us now because we changed. We changed the, we, we changed the narrative. We changed our identity from being that, that dude to the dude that can help, can assist them to move forward. I have an idea. Um, by the program that we've also put into effect. It's called RESET. And RESET means Responsible Ethical Service Embracing Transformation. Uh, one of the things that is not noticed about returning to society is that everybody want to try to help us with the outside resources, but nobody's dealing with the problems that we've all got going on with the inside. 
you know, I don't care what kind of money you put aside to, to the community. I don't care how many buildings you build. I don't care how many programs you put there. You know, you dealing with them from a physical level. You know, and our problems are internal. So in order for a lot of our brothers to assist us to understand exactly what their role is, they got to come in contact with the concept and make it possible for them to line themselves up again. Right? They need to be responsible. They need to know what responsibility is all about. They need to know what being ethical is all about. You know, they need to know what uh, 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 service, service is, what this, what this all about. And then embracing the transformation. I mean, at some point, you know, some of my brothers and sisters, you know, they look back on their past life and they think that's who it is that they used to be. And I like to tell the story. What they said, when I was in prison, I took critical thinking classes, right? And so in the class, they said that you have to think about your thinking. You know, you can't solve the problem with the same thinking that got you into the problem. You know what I'm saying? And so with that, I say that we uh, need to think bigger. I think that that's the problem right there. I think we absolutely need to think smaller. We absolutely need to think community. We absolutely need to think in individual because each individual has a role in the duty. We have to ascribe people to where they are inside of the communities in order to make that difference. And then because it, because what um, because the closest thing to international is actually local. Local is the closest thing to international. A local solution is a global solution for everybody. And so making sure that uh, we pay attention to what we have to do uh, with ourselves inside uh, our community. I'm not, I'm not ever changing. I'm always evolving. I'm always growing. I'm always elevating. I'm always going to be who I am because that's who God made me to be. But I also know that there's laws and rules and regulations. And just like you know how to make a law and a rule, I'm going to figure out how to do the same thing. And so when we implement local laws and local policies, if we want to change the language, change the narrative, it has to come from international human rights language. Let's put that inside of the local elections for while everybody's running for city council. One of the things that I think we need to do and the claim is that we need to stop it, trying to be black and be human. I think that's terribly important because this way we can show people what humanity looks like. You know, some of our greatest leaders uh, change their approach to doing a lot of things in our, in, in our communities by recognizing the fact that I'm a human being. You know, I'm a human being, you know, and, 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 and that's the bottom line is who we have to work with. So once we acknowledge the fact that we are human beings, then we can approach it from a human standpoint to allow ourselves to give them the best example that they can see. You know, and one of the things that is that I think impedes with that is the fact that we're pushing blackness. We're pushing blackness, you know. And I think, in my, in my understanding of things, now the next, Martin Luther King, these brothers uh, went to, the like the song said, beautiful struggle. But things didn't turn around until they started talking about humanity. As long as they were black, it, it, it was no problem. Right? And when they came, when they started talking about, well, wait a minute, man, we're human beings. That's when the storyline changed. So I think we can learn a lot uh, from where it is that they stood, the things it is that they done, because it was not in vain. So I believe, I truly believe it takes a community to build, to build a child. We have gotten away from community. Uh, and, and many people don't embrace, embrace us when we come home as a community. Because it's all we said in the back of somebody's mind. You know he was in jail. Or, you know, he was in the penitentiary. And he, this is what he was in there for. Um, we learned from our ancestors. I mean, my grandmother, I can remember him coming up. It was the community. But they instilled in us a direction that, that we eventually came to bear. Uh, it's important that we start really looking at history. It is really important that we go to community. You know, those drugs, now that they become to come into the suburban community, it's become a problem. But it's always been in African America, the black and brown community. Uh, so we have to educate our children that it's not cool to smoke weed. And this is, this is, Real talk, you know, we have to change that mentality. We have to change that mentality that, that the only way that people think that they can get out is by selling drugs. 
you know, we're doing the wrong thing. That's what keeps the penitentiary filled. We have to, we have to change that narrative. I'm gonna keep talking about changing the narrative. You know, music is definitely a way to do it. Um, if we're doing it in a positive way and not in a negative way. Um, we have to hold our, we have to hold our leaders accountable. You know, just like we have to hold me accountable to do the things that I'm doing. I'm gonna be held accountable by the community and the people that I serve. But that is, that's what our calling is. Our calling is to educate, to uplift our folks, but uplift everybody. This means uh, responsible, ethical servants, embracing transformation. It's terribly important that we do that. It's terribly important that we encourage them to do that. Because like the brother said earlier, that mess didn't work for you before, it didn't work for you now. So we got to give them a whole other view. We got to give them a whole other concept about life. And we don't want to do that. So so I begin to talk with the brothers and let them know, point blank, that and you're not going to use the N-word around me. We're going to have a decent conversation, and it's not negotiable. You know, if I don't give you any reason to disrespect me, and I'm not going to disrespect you, so we're going to be civilized human beings right now. And they accept that because I'm fine with it. See, you know, if you begin to drop the ball with some of these young brothers, you know, and let them see that you're really not sure what it is that you're saying, they're running over, you know. And this is going to make them think that what they're doing is correct. So, again, I think we need to start a program, all of us, that would allow them to make a transformation from that mindset to something much better. And one of our reasons is God never changes the conditions of a person until he changes his heart. Yes. So if your heart ain't right, your head ain't right. So we got to let them make the connect, connect the connection so they can get themselves right in the right path. And they scatter that. Why? It represents the fact the code that they have to change and they're afraid to change. Some of the most intelligent people that I know are behind those walls. They were my teachers. They was the ones who motivated me to give back. 